On Sunday mornings, we uh, typically teach through books of the Bible. And uh, I'm currently teaching uh, through the New Testament uh, book of uh, James. And next week, I'm going to finish it. So read ahead, chapter 5. And uh, I'm looking forward to going back to the Old Testament and 2 Samuel after that. So it's pretty uh, exciting. But today we have a special uh, guest teacher with us, and it's uh, Mark Spence. And Mark is the vice president of Living Waters uh, Ministry. He's actually also the dean of their online school of biblical evangelism. He also co-hosts the uh, television program, The Way of the Master. Have you guys ever seen Way of the Master or know of The Way of the Master? Okay, a bunch of you, right? Ray Comfort, you know that name, and so they're partners in that uh, ministry. He's also a former uh, Calvary Chapel pastor. And you know, uh, I shared this first service, but I'll do it again since you weren't here. Um, the Way of the Master uh, revolutionized the way that I share my faith. Because, you know, sometimes it's kind of difficult to get the conversation started or know what to say when you're talking to that person standing there. And when I discovered Hell's Best Kept Secret and some of the other tools that they had on their, on their website about that we make sure that we, we, we share the law because the law is what convicts people of their sin and then turn them to, to the grace of God and what he's done for us that like revolutionized the way that I handled those situations, you know? And, um, you know, I've been praying about ways to help you guys with that. And so we, we reached out to their ministry to have, uh, have them come here and to, you know, just give you another tool and to encourage you to stir us up uh, for good work so we would do the work of an evangelist, you know? And so uh, with that, uh, we've invited Mark Spence here. And so would you guys uh, welcome our brother in the Lord? Uh, Mark Spence. Well, I'm excited to hear what I have to say after that. It, it, it is a delight to, to be here. It's probably been 20 years since I've been to Idaho. I've been 36, 37 countries, 49 states, and I feel like I'm home. Right, I feel like this is uh, this is family. Uh, my, my my family is very supportive of my travels. My wife especially. You know, she, sometimes she offers to take me to the airport two days early. <laughs> We're going to be in First Corinthians, chapter two. First Corinthians, chapter two, verses one to five. So open up those apps. If you have the Bible, I love the sound of rustling pages. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. First Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I'll be reading from the New King James. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's pray. Father, regardless of why we've come, we're here. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would sift through us and remove that which doesn't belong. Our heart's desire is that we would have a relationship that is evident and one that is golden. May you do what you need to do here today to get our attention. May you perform heart surgery on us and may you mend us up. We're excited. We're excited knowing that you only do great things. You know our rising up and our sitting down and you know our thoughts from afar. And it's not just because you are afar off, 
but you know our afar-off strange thoughts. You are acquainted with all of our ways. May you meet us where we are at. And we commit this to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may remain standing for the rest of the time. It was very common in the Old Testament for the people to stand and the teacher to sit. We need to bring that back. <clears throat> I teach evangelism and apologetics for a living. I travel to different universities. I speak on college campuses. I debate with professors. I have our television program. And if I could be honest and transparent with you for just a moment, it is not easy to do so. And it's not easy because it's difficult for me to be in front of people. You may not think that as I fluctuate my voice, as I, what seems to be, getting eye contact, and as I move from one side to the other side. But truth be told, it is my greatest fear. My greatest difficulty is being in front of people. And I do believe that white lies, half truths, exaggerating, and fibs is all equating to lying. So God is my witness that I would much rather gargle turtle vomit than stand before you. I read quite a few books, probably a book a week, if not more. And a lot of books that I have read is dealing with how to communicate, how to relate, how to connect. And I say that for this, if I could stand up here with diapers under my armpits, and I have them under my armpits, they're sewn into my t-shirt, they're called Thompson Tees. If you're a sweater like me, look it up, Thompson Tees. They save my life, and I go through probably one a month. I know that if I could stand up here, well then you can cross the street and share the gospel with your neighbor. You can have a gospel track in hand, ready to go, to go to the highways, byways, and the getterways to compel people to come. And I don't know about you, but I am tired of saying, here am I, Lord, send him. Send her. He's got one-third of the New Testament memorized. She doesn't have a testimony like I've got. It makes sense why you want to use them, but not me. The damage that I've left in the wake of this thing called life as I desired in life to be a con man, to be the best con man this world has ever seen. Traveled throughout Europe, did a lot of sleight of hand, escaped out of straitjackets from uh, different card of Montes. I desired to con people out of money. I barely got through school. I got kicked out of Bible college. And I did a word search on this thing called sovereignty. And as I studied out this word, sovereignty, I've come to realize that the best definition really is that God does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, to whomever he wants. And he answers to no one. And he doesn't care what you think. God is in heaven and he does what he pleases. And I thought, because of my sin, the things that I've done in darkness, that it disqualified me, that it put me on God's proverbial bookshelf, only to be admired from a distance and never to be used, never to be read. When my heart's cry has always been, oh, that I might be a coin, a token in the hand of God, ready to be spent wherever I walk. I do not want to be that guy that hands God a bucket of excuses as to why I never stepped out of the boat. Because truth be told, it doesn't matter how tumultuous the storm is, as long as your eyes are on the Lord. I have a motto. If I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail by falling forward. I'm done with smooth knees, sight walking, mundane prayers. I want to be an individual who says, I can't, you can, let's go. And my motto is, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail by falling forward. And my children know that, and they hold me accountable. 
God bless them. For example, not too long ago, I wanted to take my little daughter Ella on a little daddy-daughter date. I wanted to take her to someplace a little bit nicer than where I normally take her, so I took her to Wendy's. <laughs> and as I'm looking up at the dollar value menu items, there were a group of college-age students that came in. The guys in business suits, the women just as nice. And I said, why are you dressed so nice? And they said, well, we are part of an epidactic debate team. We just came from a mock trial. We are all practicing to be lawyers. I said, oh, well, who won the debate? He said, we did, of course. We've never lost. And then as if he was gazing into my soul, he said, we will debate anybody at any time, on any subject, and in any place. Now you can imagine as I debate regularly what my response was. Good luck with that. And I proceeded to walk away and I sat down at the table eating my frosty and fries when one of them had blasphemed really loud. My daughter with eyes as big as saucers looked at me and said, Daddy, you got to go share the gospel with them. <laughs> Peanut, you best just shut your mouth. <laughs> and then somebody blasphemed again really loud. Daddy, you at least have to go give them all gospel tracts. And I went, honey, I don't have enough for everybody. She's all, I do in the car. <laughs> of course you do, my little homeschooled princess. And as we made our way out to the car, I looked at her and I said, you know how nervous daddy gets. Let's pray. Six years old, she looks at me and she says, daddy, there's a time to pray and there's a time to move. <laughs> so I grounded her, right? <laughs> we made our way inside to the corner where all these students were at and I said, hey, listen, my little girl Ella right here, right, where did she? <laughs> Baby, what you doing under the table? And so she was, nervous as nervous can be. And she said to me what I always say to her, you can do it with God's help. I had the tracks in tow and I looked at the group of students. I said, hey, my little girl wanted to make sure that you each got one of these. It's a million dollar gospel track. It's a cool little souvenir. On the other side, there's a Christian message. It tells you how you can avoid hell, come into a relationship with your maker and go to heaven. I have enough for everybody, but you don't need to take it if you don't want to. And I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where something comes out of here, but you know it didn't originate up here. And as fast as it came out, I tried to shove it back from whence it came. Would you like to have a debate right here in Wendy's? <laughs> Who's the head of your debate team? They said, well, that's Dakota. She levitated over everybody, came down in the midst. The chosen one has arrived. And she says, what would you like to debate? And I said, well, I'm a Christian. Let's debate whether or not Christianity is true, whether the Bible is true, whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And it didn't matter what nuanced branch of Christianity that I came up with, she was ready to go. Isn't that convicting? As a card-carrying atheist, she was ready to discuss my worldview. You know, as Christians, there's only two times we are called to be ready. In season and out of season. So we debated whether Christianity is true. I looked over at the, everybody else and I said, you're going to be the jury. You decide at the end who won. Now here's the thing, I don't care what they think. If I share the gospel, I won. Ken Ham had called me up before he debated Bill and I, the science guy, and he said, hey, who do you think is going to win the debate? I said, I think whoever shares the gospel is going to win the debate, and I'm not expecting too much from Bill and I. I went first, she went last. I said, all right, Dakota, you get the closing remarks. No rebuttal, say whatever you want to say. And she didn't say anything. Her mouth was shut. I'm reminded of the words of the late great presuppositional apologist, Greg Bonson, 
who said it is not our job to open people's hearts. It's our job to close their mouths. And with the right dosage of apologetics and the use of the law to bring the knowledge of sin, speaking the truth in love, that very thing will take place. So I looked at the jury and I said, so are you ready to repent? Are you ready to place your faith in Jesus Christ? And they all just walked away, didn't say a thing. Except for one, one person, he said, are you kidding me right now? That was awesome. He's all, listen, man, hey, I watch you every single day. And to see you do this in person, awesome. I said, man, hey, where were you 30 minutes ago? He said, I had your back. I said, yeah, way back. Nobody asked what my Twitter handle was. Nobody asked to follow me on Facebook. Nobody asked Jesus to come into their hearts. They just laughed. And on a surface level, you would think it was not a very valuable, not a very fruitful encounter. And I think we confuse two words. Fruitfulness and faithfulness, baby. God is not calling you to be fruitful. He's calling you to be faithful. You be faithful with the message that God has entrusted to you, the life, death, burial, resurrection of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then God will be faithful to preserve his name, and he'll bring forth fruit as he sees fit. You be faithful. And even when you're faithless, he remains faithful. He's going to preserve his name. Now, I have great difficulty in going forward, but I'm reminded of these words of Hudson Taylor, the great missionary. He said these words, all of God's giants have actually been weak men, but they did great things for God because they simply believed that God would be with them. I'm stepping out of the boat. I trust you're with me. And if I, if I sink, you're going to catch me. I'm going to get into the batter's box. I might strike out, but listen, I'm in the batter's box. You stay on the bench. If I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail by falling forward. 1 Corinthians 1.27. God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Mark 1.17, Jesus said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you to become a fisher of men. Notice he doesn't say he's looking for fishers of men. Let's all, all the fishers of men, gather together, and then we're going to go out into the highways and the byways. No, he's looking for ability, which is availability. Because the best ability is availability. You make yourself available to him who is omnipotent. And you'll realize that there's nothing too hard for God. One with God will always be in the majority. And it doesn't matter who is against you if God is for you. Here's the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Corinth. And he says, I've got issues. I've got problems. And before we look at that, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. He says, and pray for me also, for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. What's he saying? Listen, gang. Of all the people in the New Testament that you would presume was bold already, yeah, maybe you throw Paul in the top five. I would. Nope. Right here, he's saying, hey, church, Ephesus, I need boldness. Yeah, what else do you need? Yeah, that's about it right now. Corinth, hey, when I talk to you, you lame church, I had issues. What were those issues? We read it earlier. 
I did not come to you with excellency of speech. When I was with you, I had weakness, and I had fear, and I had much knee-knocking, I think I threw up in the back of my throat, trembling. And then he finishes it all off with the end of verse 4, where he says, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Listen, I'm not trying to pull one over on you. I just, it's him. You cannot impress people with Jesus when you're still trying to impress them with yourself. There is no such thing as a cool Christian. You need to get over yourself. God already has. We're done trying to impress. Now we're here to mirror. We're here to reflect. As the moon does the sun, we reflect the glory of God. Always ready to speak. And I think so many times we hide behind our inadequacies, our handicaps, and we've called them excuses. And as my professor at Calvary Bible College used to say, God does not forgive excuses. He only forgives sin. But maybe your excuse is a sin. Thirteen of the fourteen judges found in the book of Judges all had handicaps. They all had a legitimate excuse why they weren't the person for the job. And they said, but God, but God, can we come together with those two words, but God? Oh, how many more times we would step out of the boat if we realized, but God, but God. I was ministering a, a few years ago in uh, Kauai, right? Somebody's got to do it. And I'm ministering there in Kauai at uh, Calvary Chapel, Kauai. And my wife uh, and I, were, we found ourselves in this canoe, and we had a guide that we had hired who was in another canoe. And he was leading us to all these really cool waterfalls and stuff. And my wife says, hey, share the gospel with the guide. I said, baby, you're learning submission. No, shh. She says, oh, come on, he's not going to ask you a question you don't have an answer for. And it's not because I have all the answers. I just learned to kind of maneuver through the conversation to get it back to the gospel. That's really what it is. So I shared the gospel with him. And he said, no, I asked him, I said, hey, have you ever heard this message before? And he said, well, up until last week, I would have said no. But some guy shared this message with me. And it sounded a lot like what you were saying. You know, he's some Christian singer named Jeremy Camp. <laughs> now, here I am in Kauai. I live in Los Angeles, California. Jeremy Camp lives in Nashville. The three different states kind of come together, and unbeknownst to everybody, the following week, I'm speaking at a music festival in Ohio, for Jeremy Camp. So I go up to Jeremy one week after Kauai. And I said, hey, Jeremy, two weeks ago you were in Kauai. <laughs> you had a guide. He led you to these waterfalls. He gave you a turkey sandwich. His name was Jim. He goes, hey, man, how do you know that? I go, listen, hey, relax. Hey, two weeks ago, or last week, I was in Kauai. Two weeks ago, you were in Kauai. We had the same guide. And I was able to water what you planted, man. He said, man, that is so super cool. And isn't it, gang, isn't it cool that every once in a while, God just kind of pulls back the veil and says, hey, I'm up to. What are you up to? Yes. And he doesn't always have to tell us what he's up to, but know this. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yours workmanship. The Greek word poema. English word poem. You are the trophy of his praise. The expression of his heart. The symphony of his grace on display for people to see. And he created you for one singular purpose, to know him, to make him known. That God has created you to know the creator of sunsets. 
and surfing and seafood and sex. To know the sun that stands beyond the sun that shines every day. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. And if you're anything like me, it's hard to be in front of people. So what do I use? I use gospel tracks. Everywhere I go, and I've said for years, if you ever catch me in public without a gospel track, Ray Comfort will give you $1,000. I don't got that kind of money. We don't get to choose what is true. We only get to choose what we do about it. And the truth of the matter is that God has chosen the preaching of the gospel to save people. How will they hear unless a preacher is sent? That's not a rhetorical question, though it is as it's laid out there. You need to answer. If not, you will then who? And if not now, well then when? God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save people. I like to use gospel tracts because I was saved by the use of a gospel tract. I found a Harvest Crusade brochure on the ground. I picked it up and I went to the Harvest Crusade with great glory and I got saved. The best man at my wedding was part and dealt with the Mexican Mafia saved by the gospel track. Hudson Taylor, who we quoted earlier, saved from a gospel track. And you may be too fearful to hand it to someone, but surely you can drop it into a case of beer at the liquor store. I got a phone call. What is this I found on my case of beer? I said, well, I don't know, what'd you find? He said, oh, it's a piece of paper. It talks about Jesus. I go, oh, well, read it to me. <laughs> and so he did. He read the whole thing which means he read it now twice. <laughs> Do you know anybody that prays for bad service at a restaurant? All right, why would you do that? Well, what, what, if, what, if, what if life really wasn't about the white picket fence life? What if it really wasn't about having the perfect kids, never coming down with cancer, always having six figures inside your bank account. I mean, well, what if life really wasn't about that junk? What if your life really was not your own? That you were bought with a price and what lies before you is a stewardship from the owner for the owner. What if? What if the solar system really didn't evolve around you? Revolve. What if? What if this whole point on living was to point people back to Jesus Christ. What if? Well, then you could pray for bad service at a restaurant and not care. Hey, this food is cold. It should be hot. Yeah, well, listen, your server's not into it. Your server wants a tip. So why am I there? I'm there to give my server a good tip regardless. And if he gives me bad service, I'm going to talk about grace on the back. And when the food's dropped off, I'll look at my server and I'll say, Hey, Janet, we're about ready to pray and thank God for this food. Is there anything in your life that you need prayer for? I'm going to tell you, you'd be shocked to find out how many people will actually sit down, begin to weep, and say, Yeah, I have this going on in my life. I had one lady say, I actually had a couple people say, Yeah, just pray that I get a big tip from this table right here. But to talk about grace, God's unmerited favor to the infinitely ill-deserving. They don't deserve a tip. Right. That's why it's called grace. They don't deserve it. And God's grace, heavenly grace, is not given by calculated measure. He doesn't say you need a little bit more than her, and she needs a little bit more than you because you've sinned a great deal. God's grace just flows and it flows and it flows and it... Listen, I say come underneath the spout where God's grace comes pouring out. I'm going to be at Niagara Falls here in a couple weeks speaking at a conference. Bringing my son along with me. And I'll say, son, you bring a thimble to the bottom of Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls will fill that thimble with water. But if you bring a cup, it will put a little bit more in there. You bring a swimming pool, Baby, it's going to be big. That's like God's grace. How big of a cup are you bringing to God? 
How much of you is still in the cup? D.L. Moody said, God does not fill dirty vessels. And maybe we just need to come clean about our depraved indifference when it comes to the lost. What does that mean? Did you know you can be guilty of a crime called depraved indifference? Imagine sitting by a pool at the Marriott. And as you're reading a good book, a toddler finds his way into that area, falls into the pool and drowns. You look over and you don't do anything about it. You didn't open up the gate, you closed the gate. In fact, somebody else left that open. They fall into the pool and they drown. But you didn't do anything to extend a hand of mercy and help to save that child. You'll be charged with a crime called depraved indifference. Depraved means lowly. Indifference means you could care less. You couldn't care less. I always confuse those two. But isn't that the state, sadly, of so many people that bring a shadow to the pulpit and fill up the pews when they don't share their faith with people and they go person after person, they come in contact with salesperson after salesperson, they've seen the same barber month after month and they never share the gospel? Guilty of depraved indifference. I couldn't care less and I couldn't go any lower. Listen, traffic accidents are not a bummer. Pull over to the side and offer prayer. Homeless people on the side, have a homeless bag like we do and have granola bars and a, a, some mittens and some socks. We'll work for food. Hey, listen, I'm gonna give you some money. Go work that corner and hand out some gospel tracts. If you do what I do, as I recently went and purchased a $60 suit at Walmart, drop some gospel tracts into some clothing pockets. And I teach my kids, listen, you are not created for time, but for eternity. So no wonder you feel like you don't fit in. And my kids say, hey, Dad, you know, I have my allowance here. I want to go to, uh, you know, a fast food restaurant. I say, oh, no, we don't eat there. He's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to order something for me, but I just want to pay for the person behind us. And I want to give a gospel tract. Two, one to the person taking the order, and then the other one is for them to give to the person behind me who I want to buy their food for. And I'm like, wow, you're getting it. You're getting it. In fact, let me show you a video of my kids as we go about our daily lives, how they are just convinced that the gospel is not something to be hoarded, but something to be shared. We live in the age of information. Every day, new devices are invented to help us communicate with each other in easier and faster ways. But in spite of all the social networking and all the electronic gadgetry, there's one non-electric method of communication that remains consistent as a highly effective way to communicate the gospel quickly and painlessly. Behold, the gospel track. The gospel tracks come in all different shapes and sizes. Some are funny, some are serious. And they range from short and sweet to much more in-depth. And every good track contains two elements, the law and the gospel. Now the law needs to be in a track in order for the reader to understand why they need a savior, right? Because they've broken God's law. And the gospel needs to be in the track because, well, that's the whole point of a gospel track. The gospel.
You know, your kids are going to value evangelism as much as you do. They're going to share as much as you do. A lot of times evangelism and things like this are caught, not necessarily taught. I have a desert bookstore right by my house, this Mormon bookstore, and I go in there all the time to put tracks inside the books. Hey, Larry, what's up? Hey, Mark. No idea that I'm not LDS. Not a clue. And who's to say God's not going to use that? David Brainerd, the great missionary who died at the age of 29, he said, Lord, help me not to loiter on my way to heaven. Help me not to loiter. We cannot waste time because there's no time to waste. And as difficult as it is for me to be in front of people, I do it. Let me share with you, for example, how I share the gospel on the college campuses. If I'm not invited into a forum class in order to teach on a subject, usually I'll teach theodicy. It's the problem of evil. If God is loving and all-powerful, why is there evil? Why is there suffering in the world? And then I'll, the last hour, I'm there for two hours. First hour is the lecture. The second hour is Q&A from the students or the faculty. And they come up and they ask whatever question that they want to ask. Is that okay? Is it okay to be asked a question you don't have an answer for? You can say, I don't know, and that's an answer. But listen, I'm, I'm going to fall forward. But if I'm not invited into the classroom, I'll say something like this. Okay. All right. I know that I'd much rather lick the inner lining of a Tibetan yak's ulcerated small intestine than be here right now, but here I am. Ladies and gentlemen, ha <clears throat> La ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Uh, my name is Mark Spence, and I'm a Christian. I'm unashamed to be called a Christian. I believe that Christianity is intelligent. I believe the hardest hitting questions that have plagued humanity since man has brought a shadow to this planet are answered only in Christianity alone. Right, I don't know if you're an atheist and you adhere to the tenets of the flying spaghetti monster. Maybe you're a, a Mormon. I, I'm a descendant of uh, Joseph Smith, in fact. Uh, maybe you're part of the Baha'i faith and you think uh, Bahula is a great messenger as well as Jesus. We can agree to disagree, go our ways. You consider all the major religions of the world. I mean, they all claim to point to truth. In Hinduism, their sacred text, the Vedas, it says that truth is mysterious. It's elusive, it's hard to find. Buddha, at the end of his life, he said he was still searching for the truth. Muhammad, listen, we're not enemies if you're a Muslim. But if you're a Muslim, you know that Muhammad, he only claimed to point people to the truth. And Jesus Christ, however, he never said that truth was mysterious, elusive, hard to find. He never said that he pointed people to the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then these provocative words dripped from his mouth like honey when he said, no man comes to the Father but through me. And they tried to stone him because he was unlike any of the other prophets. All the other prophets spoke from authority. But nobody spake like this man spake because he spoke with authority, not from. He was able to hush the seas to sleep, make the lame walk and the blind see. He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So if you have questions, come up to the microphone. Somebody once said, be careful with the questions that you ask because there's answers. And be careful with the statements that you state because there's consequences. Every worldview has a consequence. So maybe you're wondering, how can you trust the Bible because it was written by men? Or why the Bible, not the Bhagavad Gita? Come up to the microphone. I'm not your enemy. In fact, I'm your best friend here today because I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is... Unless you repent, you'll perish. What does that mean? And why does it say what it says? Well, we've all broken God's law, the Ten Commandments. You only need to tell one lie to be considered a liar. In the same way, you only need to rape one person to be a rapist. Murder one person, you're a murderer. You've stolen one thing, you're a thief. You've ever told one lie, you are a liar. You look with lust, you're an adulterer out of your heart. Joseph Aline said every unconverted man would kill God if he could only get to him again. Your heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked above all things. What you're in need of today 
college students is God's grace, his unmerited favor to the infinitely ill-deserving. God doesn't care who made your bed this morning. He knows this. He knows all about you. You, sir, God knows you. He knows your name. He knows your name. In fact, he knew what your name was going to be when your parents were deciding between half a dozen names. He has the hair on your head numbered, literally labeled is the real picture, a name for every hair on your head. He knows all about you. He knows the classes that you're taking, the classes you want to drop. He knows you're a far off thoughts, not because he's a far off, but because you have these thoughts that you think that nobody understands. He gets it. He understands. You've broken God's law. But the Bible says that Jesus paid the fine. So either Jesus Christ is your substitute who suffered in himself the wrath of the Father, and in so doing, he actually satisfied the demands of the law. He appeased the wrath of the Father. So you can either fall prostrate down at his feet, you can kneel now or you can kneel later, one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It will bring glory to the Father. Or you can wait and you can reluctantly do it later. Man, I'm your best friend. I'd much rather be considered your enemy and tell you the truth than for you to say, hey, just be my friend, pat me on the back, say everything's okay. Everything's not okay though, I can't do that. So does anybody have any questions? If we're going to fail, let's fail by falling forward. We have the message of eternal life. We can't hoard it. And you have about as much chance as a sin-loving sinner coming to church as you do a bank robber visiting a police station on a Wednesday afternoon. They don't do it. And God has entrusted you with a message. Today is the day to prepare people for their last day. A lot of times people say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'll tell you what. Uh, you have a little bit more boldness than I do. I don't have the courage perhaps that you got. Listen, no, an act of courage isn't necessarily done by those who feel brave when they do it. True courage is he who feels the fear and he does it anyways. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's the conquering of it. Move forward. Get into the batter's box. You don't need a voice coming out of heaven telling you to go to your neighbor. You don't need a voice when you have a verse. And the verse says to go. What are you waiting for? I don't know enough. You know enough. Do you know enough to get saved? then won't you share that? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Come taste. Come behold. The first person Jesus ever sent out was Legion, the demoniac, cutting himself over in Decapolis on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. He's cutting himself in the limestone rocks. He's no longer naked and beside himself. He's coherent, able to think clearly. And what does he try to do? I'm going in the boat. I'm going over with you, Jesus, and the disciples. Man, this is cool. You set me free. And Jesus said, no. Go home to your family. Tell them what great things God has done. Go. Imagine the type of study that this guy could have had if he would have stayed with Jesus. What a cruel man Jesus was. No, you know enough. Go. We can't hide behind our excuses anymore. If you want to hear God's voice, well, then read God's word. If you want to hear God's voice out loud, well, then read his word out loud. <laughs> well, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Is it possible that he's already spoken? And we're not doing what he's already told us to do? What's he going to say now? Can't get to step three unless you go through steps one and two. I read about a man of old who drew a circle in the center of his room. He got inside that circle and he said, God, send a revival and start with everybody inside this circle. Start with me. 
What was it? Was it John Knox that said, God, give me Scotland lest I die? He said, no, I'll give you Scotland, but you first must die. Die to yourself, die to your dreams, your hopes, your inspirations, your aspirations. Life is not about the white picket fence. We're all soon going to be gone from this place. And quite possibly there will be those who are going to tread where we now walk. A hundred years from now, it's all going to be over. It's all going to be through. There's going to come a day where we're going to dot our last I, cross our last T, send our last email, text OMG for the last time. There's going to come a time where you're going to see your, your child for the last time, your mom, your dad. And every day those things continually climb. The list continues to grow. Does God have permission to be God in your life? How about giving him permission to do whatever he wants to do with you, including giving you cancer, allowing your spouse to commit adultery, your child to be wayward, lose your job? It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. You and your faithfulness, O Lord, have afflicted me, and now I keep your way. Oh, that God would stamp eternity on our eyelids, that whether we're awake or asleep, we have these thoughts, these visions, that life is about Him. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to prepare people for their last 150,000 people will die every day. That's 54 million people every year. Pass from time on into eternity, and I can guarantee you most of those people are planning for tomorrow. When death comes knocking, you'll answer. 100 years from now, all of us will be gone. I don't want any of you to die with a bucket of excuses. John Corson, one of my favorite preachers, he tells the story, and I might go a couple minutes over, but that's okay. I don't, my plane doesn't come till six. <laughs> you realize we're always in a hurry to go somewhere, but really nowhere we really need to be, right? We get upset at microwaves because they take too long, right? We have closets filled with clothes, yet we complain we have nothing to wear. Refrigerators filled with food, yet you know, we complain we have nothing to eat. Listen, we have nowhere to go. I was watching the Lakers with my wife. My daughter was playing in the kitchen with a wooden spoon, and she had a pan, and she was hitting it. Now, you're going to wish you never heard this. This is one of the most convicting stories that I ever tell. Besides another one that I'll say in just a minute. We're going to 1 o'clock. Kidding. Don't stone the minister. And as she's banging on the pot and pan, she's making a ruckus. And I look over at my son Noah, and I said, Noah, go play with Eden inside the kitchen. He says, Dad, she's just hitting a pot. And I said, go hit a pot alongside her. And he goes, really? And I go, yeah, entertain us. Mom and Dad are trying to have some good fellowship. Koinonia here, watching the Lakers. And so he did. He goes inside there, he's hitting a pot and pan, and he yells out, Dad, having the time of my life in here. I don't know about you guys out there. Now what was happening? Noah's capacity to be able to enjoy things were at a more mature level than Eden, who was just a little toddler. But she was having the time of her life, wasn't she? It couldn't get any better. In fact, no one could try to describe what a sunset looks like to her, and it will go right over her head. He can explain different things that he has experienced that she hasn't experienced, but she won't get it. Now, Noah's maturity level is at a different level than mom and dad's. He has never had to see God come through clutch and see him provide financially at just the right time. He's never experienced what two people experience in the confines of marriage. Wouldn't even understand the concept. 
You see, my level of maturity is at a different level than Noah's, and Noah's level of maturity is at a different level than Eden's. But guess what? We're all happy. It can't get any better. Can't even understand the concept of it getting any better. What did I just describe? As John Corson says, I just described heaven. All of us at different maturity levels, to be able to enjoy Christ based solely upon the work, whether or not we walked in it or not. Can you imagine getting to heaven, playing with pots and pans and not even realizing it? The only thing that is going to matter is what you did with Jesus Christ. You can claim to be a Christian all you want. Show me your pocketbook, and I'll tell you about your Christianity. Allow me to see and search out your Google search history, and I'll tell you about your Christianity, on how much you love God. But then again, it really is not about you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And all he is looking for is somebody who makes himself available to him and says, I can't. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm sick and tired, and I'm tired of being sick. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. You have permission to do whatever you want with my time, talent, treasure. These eyes are not mine. They're yours. You want to remove them? That's your business. My spouse is not mine. My kids are not mine. Everything belongs to you from whence they came. Gang, when I get to heaven, I don't want to see any of you playing with pots and pans. No buckets of excuses coming out of Calvary Chapel Meridian. A group of people who says, it's not about our church, it's Christ, and we're going to allow him to shine in the community. Imagine living life in such a way it makes the apostles in the book of Acts actually look lukewarm. It's about him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and then I have something I want to share. I didn't get to the other convicting story. Lucky you. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would set the people of this church on fire. Thank you for the faithful proclamation of your word from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, a full counsel coming forward. May the book of James finish well. And yet may we, all of us, whether we're named James or not, may we finish well. May we run our race with endurance. And may we be faithful to fall forward, realizing that the fruit belongs to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.